when people say is as Greenland's ice sheet past the tipping point, what would be your response? I thought a lot about the tipping point question and it's enticing. However, uh, I, I push back against tipping points and then I kind of come back in the following. So the roadrunner and the coyote, the roadrunner is able to go off the cliff and that represents Greenland melting across the upper elevations, these crazy years like we had in 2012. But the, the roadrunner can come back onto land and it's safe. So Greenland can endure some extreme melting like in 2012, 2019, and recover it. Anything that could cool the climate and bring Greenland down to, well, this year, 2024, is, is starting off to be uh, not an extreme melt year. So if if we had a perpetual 2024, we're not really over the threshold of viability of the ice sheet. And so the, the point of the instability is how much time do you spend beyond the threshold of viability? If it's decades and centuries, which now that we come full circle to, well, we are on a trajectory that basically guarantees that we're on the threshold of viability of the ice. Uh, it, it's not really today in the year 2024. The committed loss from Greenland we calculated is about 4% of the area. And that translates to something like 30 centimeters of sea rise from Greenland that's committed and it'll take time to deliver. So if 2024, for example, stayed constant, it would be not a huge sea level contribution from Greenland in the coming decades. Now, if climate continues warming, which is more than likely, then the loss commitment grows. My best guess, if I had to put it out in numbers, so by 2050, 40 centimeters above 2000 levels, and then by the year 2100, 150 centimeters or 1.5 meters above the 2000 level, which is something like four feet. Those numbers follow the dashed red curve on the IPCC's sixth assessment, which represents the upper five percentile of the model calculations because the models don't deliver ice as quickly as is observed. If you take the last two decades of observations, the models don't even re reproduce that until 40 years from now. It may not sound like a lot, but have you ever been to Annapolis, Maryland? Mm -hmm. It has some sure. really high sea rise rates and there there's parks that are flooding sure. uh, at high tides and flooding at the spring tides. And I was there and I saw it and, and you talk to local people and they're just like, they're accepting it. And they, they're like, why aren't people talking about this more? But I, I have a photo of this park bench. It's, it's, it's like... You know, know exactly the feet of the mean. park bank are under salt water, and then storm surge amplifies that. And so I think it's a tyranny, actually, for us to talk about these uh, steady curve kind of numbers. We should think about the extremes when you combine this gradual upward march with storm surge mm -hmm. and places where the ocean circulation changes, the, especially the eastern coast of the United States, unluckily has quite elevated uh, sea level rise as compared to the global average, as does the tropics. There's 30% more sea level rise in the tropics than in the kind of the global north. So yeah, the expensive impacts happen because of those extremes from sea level rise plus storm surge, plus coastal subsidence from sure. uh, groundwater extraction. You know, you bring all of those together. There's certain hot spots of impact that include, uh, you know, Jakarta, hugely populous city is being moved mm -hmm. you know they're moving a city of millions of people uh, the poor will be left behind unfortunately 